So the first time I tithed, I put in money and I was like, oh my gosh. Like you're supposed to give 10% and I'm giving like just a fraction because it was a lot of money to my family and to myself. And, and, uh, and my wife would look at me like, are you sure? Like, are you sure? And I'm like, that's what they say. And I was that guy that had a hard time taking that money out of my wallet. It is, it is so incredibly mind blowing that even in this, in this pandemic that we're all in, there was all different places that we needed to, to save money at. We needed to really look at our finances and that was one that we never thought about canceling. It was one that is an automatic that, that literally is paying God first. Even in times when you're like, oh my gosh, like I, I could really use this money and I tithe and all of a sudden something great happens. I have experienced the incredible power of putting God first in my life. If I totally trust, which I do, God pays good. I'm Bradley Barrington and I put God first. What is a pocket church? Well, it's really simple. Pocket churches are small, intimate gatherings where you can connect and grow with others in your Jesus journey. Together, we watch the message, we worship, and we talk it over with the discussion questions that are provided each week. Kids service is available on demand to watch in a separate room or on a smart device. You can do a pocket with your family, friends, or in a small gathering. Every pocket is different in when and where they meet. Find a day and time that works best for you to attend or host. The only qualifications you need to be a host is that you enjoy being around people and pointing them to Jesus. We will give you all the tools you need through a weekly email with hosting tips. It's that simple. Hello, Life Church. Thanks for joining us. I was talking to a friend recently, and we were talking about the Jesus journey is like a life that's a three-legged stool. Let me explain. If you had a three-legged stool, you would need all three legs for it to sit up or it would just topple over. And our Jesus journey is like that, that if we only have two of the legs of what makes the Jesus journey, we topple over. And the three legs are prayer, that we talk to God, we let Him talk to us, we listen for Him. The Bible, that we learn scripture, we read scripture, we talk about scripture. And the third is that we give, that we give of the things that's most important to us. That's our time and our money. But really tithing is giving our first, our first of everything we make. And so many people will get one or two of those legs on the three-legged stool right, but they, they forget or they they're not ready to jump in on that third leg. And that's why our life can feel wobbly. I had someone ask this week also if we were still accepting tithes. Uh, we've had people think that the word tithe is tides, T-I-D-E-S, we thought that was cute, that it was ties like a uh, bow tie. Uh, what I'm saying is tithes because it's actually talked about in the Bible. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And he's talking about the church. Now we know the church is not physical walls, but it's bring it to the church that goes and reaches people with the message of Jesus and grows them in prayer, in the Bible, and in giving. And in fact, it even says, God says this, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. We've seen this acted out in our life. Right before the pandemic hit, Sean and I decided that rather than giving 10%, which the Bible commands us to do, instead of giving 10% of everything we make right off the top, that we would give 20%. And I feel like that even though we're in a pandemic, that God has blown open the floodgates and is blessing us in many ways because of obedience, not just to 10%, but to say, God, I know I can't outgive you. So a tithe means 10%, and a tithe is one of the three legs on the stool. So many of you have continued to give during the pandemic, and you have told us stories of what God's done in your life. We will continue to see that happen. And for those of you who will begin to tithe, let's get that, that last leg ready to go and let's see what God does. We love you so much. Enjoy the rest of the service.
When we left off last time, Paul had just left Ephesus and he really wanted to go to Corinth, but he couldn't. A conspiracy theory had been launched there by some disgruntled church people and a group of false apostles who were questioning actually the legitimacy of Paul's qualifications as an apostle. So rather than going to Corinth to avoid conflict and an ugly confrontation, Paul writes a letter. It's what we now know as the biblical book of 2 Corinthians. And even though he was deeply hurt and deeply offended by what was being said about him, it's the most pastoral of all the letters that Paul would write to any of the churches that he started. In it, we see him both comforting his people and confronting these false apostles. Last week, I left you with a practical application. I encouraged you Go and find a selfless servant, someone who's doing their job in the midst of this pandemic and bless them, a teacher or a daycare worker, a delivery driver, a restaurant or grocery store employee. And, and I said, it doesn't have to be financial. If you don't have any extra money, bless them with your words, with a thank you or an I appreciate you, uh, you're doing a great job or you know, you're making a difference. Did you do that this week? I hope you did. Because if you did, I promise you, it made a big difference for those people. This week, I wanna to try to wrap up this series we've been in by sharing a message that we're calling The Letter. So once the correspondence had been dispatched to Corinth, Paul continued in the north for an entire year. After encouraging the churches of Macedonia, he targeted and traveled to a fresh territory, the neighboring province of Illyricum, Kind of sounds like a prescription drug, doesn't it? Like, if you're taking Illyricum, you may experience side effects of, not a prescription drug, a mountainous region bordering the Adriatic Sea. It's what we now know as modern day Yugoslavia and Albania. And he indicates to the Corinthians that he and his travel companions had gone through this painful preparation process of purifying themselves spiritually just for this trip. He says, we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we're true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We've been beaten, put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We're honest, but they call us imposters. We're ignored even though we're well known. We live close to death, but we're still alive. We've been beaten, but we haven't been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We're poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, and yet we have everything. And gosh, I listen to that and I love those verses, they just resonate. They just drip with who Paul really was. You know, during this trip in the north, Paul nearly crossed the Adriatic to visit the Christians who were living in Rome. But the opportunities for Jesus in Illyricum, they left no time. And finally, in the three winter months of late 56, early 57 AD, Paul would journey back south to visit Corinth. When he arrived in mid-December, their troubles, they had subsided and no breath of controversy was heard. Instead, in a healthy and happy atmosphere, he could focus the bulk of his time on a new project, a letter to the Christians he'd for so long desperately wanted to visit in Rome. It would be the distillation, the culmination, the extraction of his hard gathered thoughts on Jesus, what it means to serve him and how to properly, passionately pursue that relationship. It would be the closest approach he'd take to actually writing a book. It would be a carefully constructed, beautifully crafted literary composition. One which, if he'd never written or spoken another word before or wouldn't after, would entitle him to rank with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle among the greatest intellects of the ancient world, if not of all time. And this letter was personal in many ways unique to the others that he'd written in the past. Paul, he already had several friends and acquaintances in Rome. 
Priscilla and Aquila had returned there from Ephesus. His friend Epinetus, who was the first person from Asia to become a follower of Jesus, he was there, as were Andronicus and Junia, who'd been in prison with Paul at some point, and among others, his friend Rufus, whose mother was like an adopted mom to Paul. These were Paul's people. He'd miss them during his travels and looked forward to seeing them again. He, he also looked forward to being able to sit and enjoy a church he'd neither started nor was in any way responsible for. He'd already been praying for them regularly for quite some time. He couldn't wait to hear about and experience their faith firsthand. He didn't plan on staying in Rome long since he was determined to go where Christ was not named. He had his sights set on Spain, the highly civilized, most westerly province of the empire. He could stop in Rome on the way, but again, he wouldn't linger since he was determined never to build on another's foundation. But since his calling was to all pagans, whether civilized or savage, educated or ignorant, he was also eager to preach the good news to those who live in Rome and to win converts there. But this visit, it would also be of mutual benefit. He said, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, yours and mine. By this time, he'd been a Christian for a quarter of a century. He was in his late 50s, mature and secure in the faithfulness of Jesus in all the changes and challenges of life. So there's this calmness and magisterial confidence in this letter. It's by far the longest he wrote. It contains some of his most profound, difficult, and beautiful writing. It's one of the most studied, critiqued, scrutinized, debated, decisive, and influential books in all the world from any time, region, genre, or religion. Its every word has been thoroughly examined under theological, philosophical, and textual microscopes. But before it could be analyzed by experts, the words were first heard by Tertius, Paul scribe for the letter, and oh, to be this guy, to hear such a great masterpiece in real time. And so with his greetings and preliminaries over, Paul dropped straight into the work at hand, and the theme rang out in the room at Corinth where they worked. He declared, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. Then Paul announced his thesis, his text, a quotation from the great prophet Habakkuk, six words in Greek that have been translated to six revolutionary words in English. The just shall live by faith. Paul kept moving. He showed how all of humanity has an instinctive awareness of God, but has knowingly rejected him and excluded him. As a consequence, pagans had slipped into a moral cesspool similar to the one that surrounded Paul in Corinth and needed to reverse their ways. But he wasn't letting his own people off the hook either. He confronted the fact that with all the privileges stemming from God's revelation of himself and their pride in their destiny as God's people, they had adopted a smug superiority toward the pagans. And they did that because they had stubborn and rebellious hearts. And it was an attitude that God wouldn't leave unpunished. And in confronting both the Jews and the pagans, Paul was clear. The whole world is accountable to God. Whether their conscience excuses them or accuses them, judgment will come on all men and women because we've all sinned. So he said, this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God through Christ Jesus will judge everyone's secret life. But now, and this was the part Paul loved, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. But Jew and pagan alike are justified by receiving his grace as a gift, by being redeemed in Jesus, who was appointed by God to sacrifice his life so as to win reconciliation through faith. So God's judgment is made plain, but his justice is made plain as well by showing positively that he is just and that he justifies everyone who believes in Jesus. So what becomes of our boasts? There's no room for them. And Paul devotes this long section to elaborate his thesis that forgiveness, it can't be earned. 
Regardless of who we are, we can only be accepted as righteous by believing in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Jesus, who was put to death for our sins and raised to life to justify us. And at that, Paul reached the first great autobiographical passage of the letter. He said, therefore, since we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we've obtained access by faith into this grace into which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope doesn't disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. While we were yet helpless, at the right time, God died for the ungodly. Why, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, one will dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. After a discourse on the origin of sin, Paul turned to the topic of backsliding or losing your salvation and how a Christian can overcome the sin that continues to trouble them. At great length, he expounded how we should treat our pre-Christian selves as dead and realize that a resurrection life was created in us when we believed. And he didn't feign personal perfection, but instead he owned his struggles. He bore his soul admitting, I fail to carry out the things I want to do, and I find myself doing the very things I hate. And after sharing his struggles, he then celebrates his discovery. Who shall deliver me? I thank God through Jesus our Lord. And he would excitedly expand on the fact that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your own mortal bodies through his spirit in you. So there's no necessity for us to obey our unspiritual selves or live unspiritual lives. Anyone who does, doesn't know the spirit of Christ. And that doesn't belong to Christ. But, and he would warm to a theme that he would go on to be one of his favorites, this idea that if Christ is in you, he leads, he takes away, he takes away fear, he gives and directs the urge to pray and creates a consciousness that we are children of God, to which he'd write, what then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies, who can condemn? Is it Jesus who died? Yes, who, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril of the sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And later in the letter, Paul urged his readers to live like those lines are true, to worship God by living our lives in a way worthy of people whose minds have been renewed rather than modeling ourselves after the behavior of the world around us. And once again, he revealed, if unconsciously he revealed many features of his own character, that the Paul of Corinth in 57 AD, he was ready. He'd been refined by the fires of life and was determined to use every one of his spiritual gifts to the very limit of his own faith, which he also recognized as a gift from God. He worked for the Lord with untiring effort and great earnestness of spirit, keeping his inward fire constantly burning so that by the time he wrote this letter, he was steady in times of distress, joyful in his hopes for the future. Prayer was as natural to him as breathing. He was a hospitable, generous man who loved to help people. He was cheerful. He didn't do his acts of kindness sanctimoniously, grudgingly, or smugly. His love was genuine and unsimulated, and he had a marked touch of sympathy, rejoicing with those who rejoiced and weeping with those who wept. He didn't choose the people who would be his companions with an eye for class, wealth, or position. The humblest Christian found him ready to go out of his way to do a good deed or share in an experience. He had a gift for counting every person as better than himself. He loved his fellow Christians and was a lovable, likable man despite his hard-earned rough edges. He counted it most important to live harmoniously with fellow believers. As for non-Christian Jews and pagans, 
Paul did his utmost to live at peace with them no matter how much they disliked him. He hated evil. He wouldn't let mockery, discouragement, the malice of antagonists or imposters loosen his grip on what he knew to be good. But instead, he blessed his persecutors and prayed for them just as Jesus had instructed in the Sermon on the Mount, which Paul could quote verbatim. He repaid evil with good, feeding his enemy if hungry, giving them drink if thirsty, and not seeking revenge, but instead leaving the Lord to look after the question of just payment. He said, don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. So as he dictated this magnum opus, this most important of works, he contemplates and channels all the challenges he's faced for the past 25 years. The mocking and the loneliness, being beaten with sticks and whipped over and over again. The prisons and dungeons he was left to rot in, being shipwrecked and lost at sea. And he details how all of those struggles revealed to him how he needed to live his life so full of Jesus that there was no room left for himself. That his desire was to be able to walk into any city or situation and be so full of Jesus that the people he encountered were left with no option other than to want to embrace the same Jesus who had embraced Paul in his deepest times of need and would do the same thing for them. And it made me wonder, do I have that same impact on my situation and my settings? Do I change whatever room I enter? Am I so full of Jesus that he fills the places he puts me in? Have I been channeling the challenges of my life to change the people in my life? And I wondered, what about you? Because if you're not, that's what this letter to the Romans and ultimately you is all about. It's about channeling the challenges of your life for a change, not just in you, but in others. And so the question that I would leave you with is will you channel your challenges for change today? You know, before you can channel the challenges of your life to change others, you have to channel the challenges of your life to change yourself. And that's the essence of salvation, that you would recognize that your life is a disaster, that it's falling apart, that it's broken and in ruins, and that you would acknowledge the fact that you need to be rescued. The good news is that there is a rescuer, there is a savior, and his name is Jesus. And the book, the Bible says that if you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And so today, before we go any further, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that. And here's how we will, and just to moment I'm going to recite a few lines in a prayer and then I'm going to pause and if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you repeat those words and mean them in your heart you'll be saved rescued renewed you'll be channeling your challenges for change and so will you pray this after me say Jesus I'm a sinner but I'm sorry would you forgive me would you come into my life change me Make me different, make me new. Be my Lord, be my Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I'm so proud of you, I'm so excited for you, and I can't wait for the opportunity to connect with you. And so if you would just reach out to us, and let us know that you have started your Jesus journey. We would love the opportunity to walk that with you. But maybe you're watching this and you say, Sean, I'm a Jesus guy, or I'm a Jesus girl, but if you look at your life, you you know that you're not channeling the challenges of your life for the change of others. You've been leaving something on the table. You say, Sean, I wanna, I wanna change that. If that's you, I wanna pray for you. So God, for my friends who are watching this, would you help them? Would you help them to channel the challenges of their life to change others? Use them, give them opportunity. We'll love you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
This moment doesn't have to end now. The things that you're thinking about, you're questioning, you're mulling over right now, have a conversation with someone. Call someone up and talk about this, or if you're with someone right now, you could go to lifechurchgreenbay.com and download the discussion questions to prompt even more. And now we've added two questions every week for older kids and teens so that you can unpack the teaching together. And if you'd rather listen, try out the Chew On That podcast where Pastor Scott and a guest talk about this very message every week. You'll find these discussion questions will help you whether you're new to Jesus or you've known Jesus for decades. They will help you on your Jesus journey.